Howard Thurman wrote a book in 1955 about the songs that slaves sung. He called it Deep River. One of the things that he discovered was that although many of the songs were deeply spiritual, songs of worship, they were also often songs of protest. One such protest song says, I got shoes, you got shoes. All God's children got shoes. When we get to heaven, we're going to put on our shoes and shout all over God's heaven. Thurman writes, before they would sing the next line of that song, slaves who many times did not have shoes and had no freedom to shout or walk all over God's earth, they would look up at the big house where the master lived and they'd sing the final line, but everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Open your Bible today to Mark chapter 12. It's Jesus' last time in the temple before the cross. Here's what's already taken place. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the original Palm Sunday, has already taken place. When they were leaving that celebration, Jesus saw a fig tree that had no fruit on it. And with his disciples right there, he looked at the fig tree and he said, May you bear no fruit ever again. And the reason being is the fig tree was representative of Israel. And what had happened is Israel had stopped producing spiritual fruit for God because they had degenerated into the religion of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so Jesus curses the fig tree. Well, the next morning when they get up, Jesus and the twelve on their way to the temple, they see that fig tree. And the Bible is very specific to tell us that it was dried up from the root. My family, if you want to change the fruit, you have to deal with the root. More on that at another time. Jesus cleanses the temple. He's confronted by the scribes and the Pharisees. They question his authority. The Sadducees try to trick him with a ridiculous riddle about resurrection. The scribes want to know which is the greatest commandment, and the Pharisees try to trap him with a question about money. And Jesus is not silent, not this time. He claps back hard. He lambastes them with brilliantly enigmatic parables. Uh, He confounds their earthly, sensual, and demonic wisdom with the wisdom from heaven. He answers their questions with infinitely harder questions until they dare not ask any more. Jesus leaves the hypocrites scratching their heads with with, with their tails squarely between their legs. Our main text today is Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, where the Bible says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had her whole livelihood. So let's set the scene. This takes place in what was called the court of the women in the beautiful, opulent, lavish temple in Jerusalem with its giant gold vine, most likely the largest temple in the Roman Empire. The court of the women would be the only place in the temple where both men and women were allowed. And in this court, there would be 13 shofar or trumpet-shaped brass receptacles for offerings. The men and the women would come and cast, literally toss their coins into these brass trumpets. Like, like, Like throwing a coin into a fountain or like, now I don't know if you remember when you used to be able to throw your coins into the toll booths on the Garden State Parkway. 
I mean, you don't take a lot of coin now, right? I remember when it was 25 cents. That's how old I am. But could you imagine the sound, especially of the rich, who would come with bags of coins, and not mites, not, 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 not farthings, but shekels and denarii, larger coins, heavier coins, and throw them into this brass shofar. What a sound. People would ooh and ah at the offerings of the rich. It's where we get the saying, you know, blowing your own trumpet or tooting your own horn. It's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Jesus sat opposite the brass shofars. Each one of them would have been labeled for a different type of offering. The widow's offering would have gone into the trumpet marked free will offerings. And whereas the wealthy brought bags of heavy coins, the mite, also known as a lepton, was actually the smallest and the least valuable of all Jewish coinage. The word for mite in Greek actually means thin pieces. So somebody actually gave me a mite um, a couple of years ago. And, and I, I thought about, you know, like passing it around the room so you could see it, but I'd never get it back. So <laughs> we'll just put it right here. A mite. A lepton was approximately worth one-third of a penny. Uh, in that day, and I did the math, a mite was equal to one-eightieth a denarii, so that means it was worth less than six minutes' wages for the average laborer in that day. Literally, it was next to nothing. But not nothing. You see, God can make something out of nothing. I said, God can make something out of nothing. He made the stars. He made the galaxies. He made something out of nothing. He spoke the land and the sea and every living creature into being. He did it ex nihilo, out of nothing. So when you're feeling down and you're feeling insignificant and you're feeling like you're nothing, listen, take courage. Number one, you're not nothing. You are a child of the living God. And number two, even if you feel empty, remember he's the God who makes something out of nothing. So back to the sound, the, the, the oohs and the ahs. You know, when, when, when the big coins, the fat coins, the living large coins, silver pieces, gold pieces, shekels and denarii clanging down the throat of the brass trumpets, noisy and impressive. And then, like you could barely hear it. The tinkling of the poor widow's mites. And notice the Bible calls her a poor widow. Because in the Bible there's widows and there are poor widows. Poor widows were considered unemployable. And in Greek there was one word for poor widow. And it literally meant a widow who supported herself by her own little labor. So we don't know, but maybe she did a, a, a little bit of sewing. Maybe she did a little bit of cooking, but it was a little labor. It was so little that she got paid in mites. And think about it. it it's all she had. Two mites. She, she could have certainly kept one and given the other. I mean, her giving would not be a tithe, and it would not be 10%. It would be 50%, and there ain't nobody in here giving 50%, just saying. But she didn't. She didn't hold back. She didn't even think about herself. She gave it all. My family, that's called faith. That's called sacrifice. That's called trust. 
While the materially rich gave out of their abundance, this woman was rich in faith. And that's the only thing that really matters with God. She understood what Jesus said about true riches. She understood what it meant to store up your treasure in heaven. She didn't want her reward only in this life. She just gave into the temple treasury what she could have used to buy her next meal, to buy her next morsel of bread. And Jesus stops everything to commend her. Yes, this is a story about giving. This is a story about generosity. This is a story about offerings, but much, much more. Because whenever and wherever amongst the many places in the Bible where it talks about money, it's never just about money. It is always about our hearts. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, let's read this aloud together. Ready, everybody? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There is a heart-money connection. And Jesus just said, your money doesn't follow your heart. No, just the opposite. Your heart follows your money. Like tomorrow, just buy a small amount of stock in a company and watch how interested you get in that company and everything that affects its, its, its earnings. Why? Because your, your, your money followed your heart. Like buy some stock in Nike and, and, and watch, you'll start hissing at people who wear Adidas. <laughs> All kidding aside, most people just ramble aimlessly through life and give their hearts to everything and nothing. But those who give themselves completely to God, they set the compass of their hearts on true north. And so they never ramble aimlessly about anything. They have direction. They have purpose. This nameless poor widow who does a little work so she can have a little money, she gave beyond comfort. She gave beyond convenience. She gave beyond calculation from a sincere heart. She gave for God's sake. She gave to honor him, to worship him with her meager gifts. And she did it before him. She did it before an audience of one. No pretense, no ulterior motives. She's not trying to impress anyone. And she also shows no sign of insecurity either. And she had no idea. Right? She had no idea she was being personally observed by the Savior, by the Messiah, by God the Son. Everyone else, very calculating, very transactional, very proud, even boastful. But one thing that Jesus is pointing out to us is that the much of the world is not always much in God's eyes. Because the rich were still rich even after they gave. The rich were still rich even after their loud offering. The rich in this story were giving from their abundance but did not sacrifice their abundance. Like they may have been concerned with how much they were giving, but Jesus is obviously more concerned with how much they were keeping. And he said this widow's unassuming sacrificial devotion altogether eclipsed all the other perfunctory offerings because the Lord sees through all religious showmanship. When it comes to offerings or otherwise, Jesus ever observes realities among pretenses and a sacrifice from a pure heart will always get his attention. So when Jesus looks at your offering, and he does, Hebrews 13, 8, you can write it down. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when he looks at your offering, what does he see? Yeah, I didn't think I'd get too many amens right there. How does he feel? How does he feel? about your offering? What what, what valuation would he put on it? Let's be brutally honest today. 
Most people give out of their abundance. They give what they can spare without feeling it. So the question is, are you giving just a pittance of your abundance, or do you give sacrificially? Are, are you giving as a formality, or are you giving in faith? Because when you give just as a formality, then it's nothing more than a tax-deductible donation. And by the way, that's fine. That's fine. How many of you know it's better to give to God than to the IRS? And I think I could actually get an amen on that. Right? Right? You'll thank me on tax day. But if your giving is just skimming off of the top of your abundance where you don't even feel it, or if it's just a religious obligation or something that you can boast about, or it's just some sort of casual, non-committal gesture, well, that's where it will end. It's a donation, and that's good. But if you want to go from good to great in your giving, and if you want your heart to grow in the direction of your giving, if you want want to get the attention of Jesus when you give, if you want to get commended rather than reprimanded by the Lord, give sacrificially and give in faith believing. Because if you give in faith, it's no longer a donation. It's a seed. Did you hear me? If you give in faith, it's no longer a donation, it's a seed. And as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And he who sows grudgingly shall also reap grudgingly. But he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Listen carefully. If you're giving in faith, it's a seed. And that's good news. You want to know why? Because when it comes to inflation, Seed doesn't care. When it, even if it comes to a recession, seed doesn't care. Seed's going to do what seed does. Seed doesn't care who's in Congress, who's in the Senate, who sits in the White House. Seed doesn't care. When you sow your finances into the kingdom of God, your seed is going to sprout. Your seed is going to grow. There's a mighty oak in your acorn. There's a forest in your seed. There's a harvest of blessing in your sacrificial giving sown in faith. Want a guardrail against inflation? You want a guardrail? You want protection against a recession? Give generously, so sacrificially, even if you've got to give up spending your money on some non-essential in your life. Like sacrifice a month of Starbucks, a year of Hulu, and give that money as a free will offering to God. Like, stop playing the lottery. Stop the weekly sports betting. And give that money to God. Like, you've got better odds at getting struck by lightning than you do at hitting the Powerball. But you have guaranteed returns from God, both in this life and in the life to come. And if you will give in faith, believing God will make sure you're okay, better than okay, no matter what happens in the economy. Amen. Now let's look at it from a different angle because this story is about way more than money. In the second part of verse 43, Jesus says, Assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who gave to the treasury, more than all. Like how can somebody give less than a penny and actually give more than everyone else? Jesus certainly didn't mean more monetary value. But she definitely gave with far more self-denial, far more sincerity, far more devotion. She gave with far more love. My family, whatever you do, do it with love. 
Let me say it again. Whatever you do, do it with love. Turn to the person next to you. Tell them, say, whatever you do, do it with love. You can tell, right? You can tell. You don't, you don't need a gift of the Spirit. You don't need Holy Ghost discernment. You don't need a sign from God. You can tell when somebody just goes through the motions. You can tell when somebody does the least possible, when somebody is just checking a box, and when somebody does something with love. When you cook a meal, put your foot into it. And do it with love. Listen, nobody, no restaurant, no Michelin star chef can make carne molida like Pastor Elena or arroz imperial or Thai pasta. Want to know why? Because she does it for her family with love. When your kids or your spouse or your friends are talking to you, be present. Listen with your eyes, your ears, and your heart. Listen with love. When you pray, don't just go through the motions. Jesus taught against rote repetition in our prayers. Pray earnestly, pray fervently, pray sincerely. Do it with love. When you read the scriptures at home, when you wake up or before you go to bed or at your lunch break, don't just be read through it, okay? So that you can say, well, I read my Bible today. No, 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 no. Read slowly. Meditate the word. Do it with love. And at work, on your job, do your job with love. If you serve sacrificially at work, people will take notice. You will stand out now more than ever. And when there's a promotion, when there's an opening for a promotion, who do you think they're going to choose? The loafer, the taker, the entitled employee, the critic, the gossip, or the person who puts their heart in their work? And if you're faithful in little, I said if you're faithful in little, if you put your foot into it, if you put your heart into it, if you do all things as unto the Lord, if whatever your hand finds to do, you do it with all your might, God will open doors for you that no man can shut. I'm telling you, I prophesy to you, there are God opportunities right now. Now, for those who give of themselves wholeheartedly and serve others in sincerity. And by the way, it's the only proper way to give thanks. Yeah, it's your reasonable service. It's one thing to say, thank you, Lord. It's one thing to pray, thank you, Jesus. And that's all fine and good, and we should incessantly without ceasing. But it's altogether another thing to give thanks actionably, to give thanks demonstrably. And every time you give, every time you make an offering, every time you tithe, every time you give sacrificially, you are saying, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that I have something to give. It may not be as much as the next guy. It may not be as much as somebody else, but I sacrifice and I give it to you from my heart. And if you're here today and you don't have much, it's been hard for you. But like the poor widow, you give anyway. You, you, you find something to give. You, you, you get creative. You, you, you get resourceful. You, you stay steadfast. You move some things around because you never want to leave God out. And you've stayed faithful in your giving even when times have been tough. Pastor Elena and I want to commend you today. And even more so through this story, Jesus himself commends you today. But know this, every time you sacrifice your schedule, every time you lay down a comfort or a convenience to lift someone else up, every time you go out of your way to consider others better than yourself, you are in effect saying, thank you, Lord, that I can. Thank you that I have my health, that I have my strength. Thank you that I have some resources to be a blessing with. 
But let's drill down further still because Jesus did. Again, the second half of verse 43 into verse 44, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had her whole livelihood. This precious, nameless widow is the very definition of destitute, and yet she showed that she loved God no less for it. She didn't blame God. She didn't compare or complain. She wasn't moved by her circumstance, her situation, or her station in life. But think about it. Everyone else gave a portion. She gave all. Everyone else gave a percentage. She gave all. You see, God does not save us by fractions. And neither are we to give a mere fraction of ourselves to him. Like a compartment. Like people who say, well, God is a very important part of my life. See, people who just give God a few moments in, uh, of worship in church once a week or once a month while ignoring him in the rest of life, you know, at home, at work, at play, guess what? Those folks become religious schizophrenics. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, before the judgment seat of Christ, my service will be judged not by how much I have done, but by how much I could have done. In God's sight, my giving is measured not by how much I have given, but how much I have, I have left after I made my gift. Not by its size is my gift judged, but by how much of me there is in it. No man gives at all until he has given all. No man gives anything acceptable to God until he has first given himself in love and sacrifice. You see, with God, it's all or nothing. I'm going to say it again. With God, it's all or nothing. A tepid response is not an option. That's not on the table. Revelation tells us that if we're lukewarm with God, he'll spew us out of his mouth. He doesn't want a token of your friendship. He doesn't want a token of your love. He doesn't want a token offering. He doesn't want a token of your devotion, your commitment, your service. He wants it all. The Lord will not be your side hustle. He will only be your all in all. Like he requires nothing less than to love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And he has freely given you and equipped you with everything, with the power and the desire to do that. She put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood, her whole life, her whole self. Not, not unlike the first disciples who forsook all to follow Jesus. Not unlike Zacchaeus, who repented and immediately said, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. Not unlike the woman with the alabaster box, who broke that box and poured out that ointment. She poured out a family heirloom. She poured it all out. She gave it all. And Jesus said she did for me what she could. Are you doing the least that you can? Or have you done all that you can? Have you forsaken all to follow Jesus? Have you given all of yourself? Have you broken your box? Poured yourself out on Jesus? Have you made yourself an offering? A living sacrifice? Now listen, when it comes to our relationship with God, Tozer is spot on. Let me paraphrase him. Ready? No one has given anything to God until they've given everything to God. And when, by faith, you do, when, by faith, you lay it all down, when you surrender all, you know what happens? All the things you could never make happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't know the rest of the story for the widow, but we, we can safely say that God provided. Amen? 
that she got her next meal and she got her next meal and that somehow it was all provided for because he is Jehovah Jireh. He is her provider. He does see to it and he would see to it that she was taken care of. But we also know that the Lord multiplied those two mites that make up a farthing, just not the way we would think. You see, 2,000 years ago, she gave. And 2,000 years later, we receive. She gave and multiplied millions of people have been blessed by her life, changed by her story, encouraged by her example, inspired by her sacrifice, instructed by her devotion, and comforted by the honor that Jesus gave her that day. Like, she's in the Bible. She's in the Bible. Like, others may make the Fortune 500. Others may make, you know, the top 30 under 30 or the top 50 over 50. Others may get a Lifetime Achievement Award. But she made the Bible. She is a hero on the pages of the infallible, inerrant, living and life-giving Word of God. Look at what God can do. Oh, I'm going to say it again. Look at what God can do. Look at what God can do. Look at what, Je look at, look at what Jesus did with her formerly nondescript life. He takes a formerly uninspiring, unremarkable, unexceptional life and makes her extraordinary, remarkable, and an inspiration written on the pages of Scripture and etched into our hearts. Like her story is forever settled in heaven. Her story, heaven and earth will pass away, but her story will by no means pass away. And know this, that you don't even know what God can do with your life. Listen, you don't, this is what he did with hers. You don't even know what God can do with yours. Listen to me. Take it from somebody who was a nobody. Take it from somebody who was a 20-year-old drug addict, who was a 20-year-old drug dealer. If you would have told me back then what my life would look like 38 years later, I would say you need to get off the pipe. You need to step away from the reefer. I would have told you, you are out of your mind. But look at what God can do. Like I'm still amazed at his grace. I will always be amazed at what God did for me. Yeah, but pastor, I've never been anything exceptional. Congratulations, you qualify. Yeah, you know, I didn't win most popular or most likely to succeed. Congratulations, you qualify. You qualify from the moment you give your life, all of your life to the Lord. One last thought. So Jesus was on his way out of the temple for the very last time. It wasn't a good visit by most standards. Turning over the tables, being interrogated by religious hypocrites. And on his way out, he sees her. The poor widow with the two mites. He stops, he commends, he, he, he comments, he commends, and he memorializes, memorializes her forever. Why? What got his attention? Why her? Because he saw something of himself in her. It would only be a couple of days before he too, like the widow, would give an offering. A sacrificial offering. 
And it wasn't two mites that make up a farthing, but out of his poverty, he gave all that he had his whole life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Like if you can see that today, if you can see that today, if you can feel that today, if you can grasp what Jesus did for you, then how can you not give all of yourself to the one who gave all of himself for you? I'd like you to stand with me today for just a moment. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back out. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We'll respond to what we just read and studied in two ways today. Obviously, we'll receive the offering in just a few minutes on the way out. But before that, as the worship team sings, I surrender all. I want to encourage you as you feel the Spirit of God lead you and move you, that if you'd like to come to the front today, we'll turn the front of this church into an altar where you can come and you can stand or you can get on your knees, but you can lift your hands and surrender. And maybe there's something in your heart and something in your life that you have not surrendered. You've not been willing to surrender. You've held back. You've kept back. And today you say, Lord, I repent no more, no more. I surrender all, all to Thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. 